listening to the House by the Video Store podcast. Welcome to the House by Video Store podcast. I'm your host, William, and joined A.L.B. Sean. Hello. And on this episode, we'll be discussing the Francis Ford Coppola film, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is from the early 90s. And I'm sure if you're generally from the same age range as us, you remember the pinball machine, at least, Mm -hmm. because it was at many a pizza parlor and arcade. And it's one of those machines now, whenever I see it at some of like the barcades that exist now, I always make sure to go by and play it. Just got to remember that from that era. I uh, did not see the movie when it came out. That font is very uh, memorable, you know, because I remember like the Sega CD games and stuff like all the box art, the pinball yeah. machines, all the marketing around it and the poster like I is very iconic and like pretty awesome yeah. font design. Well, and the the movie came out in 92. So that's you know, like early 90s. I remember the pinball machine for it and a lot of the art on it being very to me as a kid seeming scary. Mm hmm. Uh, Because there was like the wolf man and and the different creatures and stuff. So like the overall movie to me always think is supposed to be scary. Uh, I did not see that until later. And then I didn't really watch. I watched as an adult in recent years. But that's something that kind of has a Halloween-ish feel to it. Just because it's one of the more classic characters and a little bit different take. And then there was also like after this, wasn't there the uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein that had Robert De Niro? Yeah. Yeah. Which I want to revisit that because we watched this through the sci-fi app or on demand and they also have mary shelley's frankenstein also on there so i remember between the two liking dracula more Yeah, i know probably that i've only sub- seen bits and pieces of both which i watch yeah. dracula now this week but uh i from my memory people talk not so well about mary shelley's yeah. frankenstein <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, but before we get to uh, Dracula, we'll go through some recent news and things we've been watching, and recent news, there's more Halloween news, I know I talked about not really bringing stuff back up until there's real news, but, um, so, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, who had also done the scoring for films such as Social Network and some others, um, did a remix of the Halloween theme that you can now listen to for free on YouTube, or you can purchase it through iTunes or Amazon or whatever your preferred music service is. It's like a seven minute long version of it that, um, I mean, it doesn't really break any super new ground. No. It's just kind of a remix of the theme. It's kind of just a cool, you know, refresh of it that seems to be more just a kind of a promotional thing or just, yeah. you know, um, Reznor and, and Ross kind of taking something and just kind of, you know, paying homage to John Carpenter to some. And so you can check that out. And then there's also apparently in different interviews, John Carpenter laid out these pretty much sound a contract to do the music for the 2018 Blumhouse Halloween. So it sounds like he'll be doing the music for that. And he didn't really know yet if it's going to be an original score, just kind of a revamp of the existing score or kind of a mixture of the two. So it's unclear exactly what all that will be. But what, sent- what do you want? Honestly, I think that work better to maybe use the main theme sparingly and then do kind of new original music. Yeah, because, I mean, honestly, that main theme is, even like the, the Trent Reznor thing, I was really excited for it, but it does, it is it is that theme. And if it was too far away, it wouldn't be that. Yeah. You know, but at this point, it's just, yes, it's very iconic. It's just not exciting in the same way yeah. anymore, you know? Um, just like Michael Myers isn't isn't as exciting anymore, so hopefully yeah. this new film is going to breathe a lot new li- a lot of new life into it. And yeah, I would like them to see take a drastically different approach. Yeah. Um, well, too- like the John Carpenter thing is really exciting, and it's cool that he's involved that much. But at the same time, you know. It seems like we're gonna, not going to get something totally unexpected out well, of the score. Well, yeah, I mean, too, they said that the movie. Well, I guess before that, just like the score stuff. Two, I think it'd be cool if they just kind of use the iconic Halloween score, maybe in like the cold open or the title to the movie, and then the rest of the movie is original music, yeah. where it kind of goes in yep. a different direction. Because if your target market, uh, the target market for this is existing Halloween fans, then if you have enough of the original score in there at the beginning, just to kind of hold them over, like okay, yeah. then here's the new stuff. Or you know, if the the movie is kind of targeting this wider general audience. Because uh, the new Blumhouse movie, Happy Death Day, which we did not get a chance to watch, uh, might have time to discuss that before October's over, but it opened to like $26.5 million. 
for an original slasher film franchise that, or, you know, an original film that we hadn't, it's not a sequel continuation. It's not an existing character, but it is PG 13. So that also opens the floodgates for PG a larger yeah. audience. Yeah. Yeah. So it's PG 13. It's in uh, theaters now. And the success of that makes me think, I mean, I think the Halloween stuff, the script is already written, I'm sure. And they're probably moving into, you know, or I think they are shooting it. So they're probably already in motion. I think it's probably... Comes out in a year from now, right? Yes. And then they claimed that it was going to the- like possibly ignore everything beyond Halloween 1, the first mm-hmm. film, where Michael and Lor- uh, Laurie Strode would not be siblings. Actually, is that the news that came out right after we podcast that last week? Yeah, because I, was- I think that was it then, because we were trying to remember what news broke. We record these on Sundays normally, and they go out on Tuesdays. And I think that was the big news that I thought, okay, this is something we've got to talk about. Yeah, because they basically just said that, you know, at least as of right now, it sounded like they're going to ignore everything past the first film. And that would make Michael Myers and Laurie Strode not siblings, which, you know, some people are upset that the series is resetting continuity yet again. Um, because I mean, you, uh, even though it's ignoring it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they they can't also do that though yeah. you know what i mean at the same time like they well, could kind potentially of, do that it's kind of like what uh fox has done with the x-men films in that logan really doesn't have a lot to do with the prior x-men films based on the timelines and character deaths and everything like that it was more of just like you have a couple of characters that are familiar with a story that's only mm-hmm. loosely connected to what you've seen before so yeah, they're I mean, kind of I mean, doing like an alternate universe version. Yeah, like at this point, why be too tied down from something that was made 30-something years ago? Well, it's been ago. reset because... And yeah, it's been already being reset before. And like, when part one was released, the Michael and Lori were not siblings. And then when Carpenter had to write the sequel, that was something that it sounds like they added into the script to give it some like momentum and a, and a story. But then he later regretted and thought it was kind of not the direction he would go if he had had more time. Mm-hmm. So it seems like... You know, trying to appease what Carpenter's original ideas were because the the franchise then got reset with part four, which, you know, said like, oh, Laurie had a daughter and then died. So here's Jamie. And then in part, you know, so parts four, five and six were one storyline. And then H2O reset it and said, no, actually, this takes place directly. You know, this takes place in the continuity. There was part one and two. And then you have Halloween Resurrection, which has trick or treat mother uh, flipper. And, and then we have the remakes, which wipe it all out. Yeah. You know? so, so now you're going back and saying the only movie that exists I, is part yeah, one. Yeah, I've seen people complain about, oh, you know, I wanted to take, you know, I like part two. I like this this element of it or whatever. But I mean, really, well, it's not another remake per se. So, you know, even if you're a type of person that wants some of it to have continuity, at least you get a little bit. But at least they're not held back by all those other ones or, you know, or even the second one. One, like, two. I'm okay with that. Yeah, and it's not like a big, huge budget action franchise where it's like a cinematic universe and you really need continuity for things to make sense. This is a slasher franchise where they're coming back to it 40 years after the original. Um, with, I mean, if you go based on the storyline it being somewhat realistic, Michael's in his 60s. Yeah. Like, now there's people like Sylvester Stallone that are in their 60s and jacked. So you can be in amazing shape and kill people easily at that age. But the average person isn't. So, like, it'd be interesting to see, like, you know, is it the real Michael Myers is mm-hmm. in the sequel? Is it a copycat? Mm-hmm. You know, like, what what's going on? So, there's a lot of things like that they are kind of, you know, we don't really have any idea. It's Laurie Strode. She's yeah. going to be real jacked. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, it can be any worse than Halloween Resurrection. Yeah, and going back to the music, too, like, I think the way uh, the music's been handled and Danny McBride and... Um, Jody Hills, uh, vice principal, vice principal yes. is so so excellent. Like I would have been happy if it was in the vein of that, which is kind of synthy, but not too uh, gimmicky or anything like yeah. that. You know, it's it's very well done, and it's it's not campy, but it's it's also keeps it a little fun, yeah. but also dark at times. Like they they handle it so well with that. So hopefully, even if you know we do get kind of traditional Carpenter. It would be great if they worked with him a lot and gave him a lot of direction yeah. and kind of forced him to go outside of his comfort zone, maybe yeah. with with some of the stuff he does with it. Because that, that yeah. would be exciting for me. Well, That's I mean, what I want them to see them do, stretch the boundaries of all this and make something exciting when, and fresh. And they could easily plug in stuff from Lost Themes 1 or 2 as well. I mean, I think he's going to do all original stuff for this. But two, the other thing that they have to avoid, which is kind of just, you know, a very cyclical thing that's ironic you have to deal with this, 
is so many recent movies and TV shows and all kinds of things have used those John Carpenter-esque synth scores that it seems kind of old hat now. Mm -hmm. yeah, and exactly. even in our short film After the Slasher, it had some synth music in it that I got from this different sound pack. So even on that, people are like, oh, I like the synth, but you know, it's kind of overused now. So you have the idea that something John Carpenter kind of popularized is now being used in a lot of things that are throwbacks to his work. So when he comes back to score something, then people will say it's derivative of other yeah. things that are derivative of his work. I mean, which is exactly why, you know, like Deacons didn't go with the... One of the reasons, I assume, he didn't go with the same look of the original Blade Runner. Yeah. Because it had been copied and derivative so much. Even though it's a sequel, it would have lessened the impact of this film yeah. to kind of see some of that stuff again in that same style because now it feels like it's old hat, you know? Yeah. So it was, again, a very smart direction on all the fronts with that film. So hopefully this one, they they really jack it up to like 11. And, and, and I think they will attempt to. They're not yeah. just going to say, hey, we love Halloween. Let's just make a Halloween film fan film essentially yeah. that is just kind of doing what Carpenter did but it's yeah. but we're doing it this time you know that's what so many people do I think when they yeah. get a hold of franchises or um or sequels and stuff like that they kind of just make a different slightly different take on the things you've already wow. seen instead of making something that is kind of from their own vision as well and yeah. I think they will make it their own vision I would love to see some dark humor in that and just yes. see it go in a direction this because I think like you said, it's like Happy Death Day made twenty six and a half million dollars off of a, I think an estimated budget of like four to five million. So another one of those kind of you know very low budget horror films that's going to turn a pretty tiny profit. So this year the box office has kind of slumped and done poorly. But when it comes to horror, you've had Split at the beginning of the year. There's kind of like a horror thriller that did very well that made worldwide over a quarter of a billion. You had Get Out that uh, was from Jordan Peele and kind of a racially tinged thriller horror film. And like one of the most successful from, was it a black director or first time? Is it a black director? I think director? it was the first time. First time black director? Yeah, I think it was yeah. the, the highest gross. Yeah. And it was, you know, it worldwide grossed over a quarter of a billion dollars as well. And, and then around a budget of five million is what they say. Yeah. But still in that yeah. ballpark, not including marketing and stuff. Yeah, I think they shot, I think they said they shot it in 18 days shooting on two cameras. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not a super huge production or anything and then it was made for a budget you know, like in the 30 to 40 million dollar range and so far in the u.s has grossed over 300 million and worldwide has grossed over 600 million so huge huge success a so horror has been doing very well at the box office this year and i think in general pop culture in general uh with like netflix and i you know, like amazon these different tv series that have very heavy and, horror influences and it helps when the movies are good too yeah you know what i mean that's the thing like uh, you know it's it, it, happy death day at least that's a, an original concept you know it seems like an interesting concept yeah um a mystery get out very interesting perspective split a really well done in night Shyamalan film that yeah. is like his the second one of his return essentially after yeah, the, the visit, visit and then um that. and then it you know based on you know stephen king stephen king everybody knows pennywise like and then it was a a well-made film from from what i've heard yeah. i haven't had a chance to see it yet Due to the baby. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that helps a lot that there's a lot of quality coming out. I was thinking about that the other day, too. I was like, I think people are just getting a lot better at making films in general. That doesn't mean every film is great, but, yeah. you know, just kind of the, even the lower bar for quality. Yeah. I think is raised, you know, I, I guess it's because of me, a medium that has been around longer, you know, 30 years, 30 years ago, there was a lot of good films that came out, but the amount of outputs and the amount of like solid quality I think is, yeah. is, is pretty good. Like people have kind of figured out what things to at least avoid. I think now, which is funny that if you look at a lot of the, like the different horror community groups and a lot of people are like, you know, like, Oh, the movies are all terrible these days and it's all, you know, just remakes and garbage. But yeah. people forget like a lot of stuff in the eighties, like the heyday of like the slasher boom from like 78 to 84. A lot of those movies weren't good. Yeah, I know. And if you rewatch them, it's like they have enjoyable aspects to them. Like Prom Night, the Jamie Lee Curtis, Leslie Nielsen movie that we reviewed not too long ago. Like, it's not good. Uh, it doesn't yeah, look good, sound good. The tension's not there. Yeah, it's like, uh, objectively speaking. But it's, you can it's enjoy it, not, and it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, but it's just like when you watch today, I think it's also that today there's so much content being created that... Some of it's rising. That, you know, yeah. like the, you know the cream rises mm -hmm. to the top and... And then two, you have, I think there's more diverse voices, even though the majority of movies are all still mostly directed by white men in a certain age range. But 
it's there is more different voice there are more voices out there mm-hmm. there's a greater you know amount of content and, and and two if people are saying oh it's all trash now maybe just where you're looking is all trash you know like yeah it, but go outside your comfort zone of films you know look for foreign films or you know different different types of cinema versus if you are just looking if you're just like we're trying to watch vod slasher films that you know people are making that are just kind of doing trying to do the same same movie you've seen a thousand times before yeah yeah not all those are that great because they're not really coming from a place of uh original perspectives or you know it's just sometimes it's first time filmmakers like you you know Look around more if if you think cinema is bad well, nowadays. You, like we're we're sitting pretty good right well, now. Well, I mean, I think too. The other thing is when you go and look at Amazon Prime, which you can easily do. There's a ton of low budget horror films yeah. on there, and part of the thing is there's so many more films being made now than there were in like the 1960s, 70s, 80s. So there's a lot there's a lot more bad films out there, but there's far more good films too coming out each year. And there's so many sources of people making films now. So not only do you have like studios and independent movies. You also have Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and others um, financing movies. Doesn't mean they're all good. There's a lot of stuff out there that's not good, but yeah. But I mean, again, I'm, is- I'm very happy with the options. Like every week, there's something good coming out. May not be in theaters, but yeah. there's all these different channels now. You know, there is, and even if you don't like a lot of Netflix output, they still put out some good stuff every now and then. Yeah, because um, like recently you've had Gerald's Game. Yeah, and um, there's Mine some- Hunter. You know, yeah, Mind Hunter. Like, so there's there's some stuff we'll get to too in the while you're yeah. watching. So there's a lot of stuff coming out. There's a ton of horror content. So it's just like horror, I think, is being proven to be bankable this year. So I wonder if next year you're gonna see a lot of people then try to get into the big studios, get into the horror films that they weren't doing before or giving it the like a bigger budget. Cause we just saw the trailer for the new mutants, which is a film in the X Men film universe at Fox. And it looks like a straight up horror film. It's essentially just like mutants in a horror film. And how that plays out yet to be seen, but I think people are realizing that, you know, the popularity of Stranger Things with its huge success, studios are going to start to see, and even the, um, the FX show Legion, the kind of mm-hmm. other X-Men spinoff had a lot of horror elements. So I think people are starting to realize that you can use horror to amp up, you know, a lot of your properties. And I think there'll be more people devoting money, real money to it, or, you know, real focus or, you know, honing in on it and realizing... Not all horror is just direct-to-video sequel trash. Yeah. Like some people thought or some critics treated it in the past. There's a wide, diverse range of films. And it doesn't have to... Yeah, it doesn't have to be put in a box either. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be just a really scary teen movie, you know, with uh, teens getting cut up. Like it doesn't have to be that. Like horror is many things. And, you know, horror is part of life. You know, everybody's, everybody's everyday experiences, you know, yeah. or, or their life experiences has horror in it at some point. Well, you know, films can be that way, too. They don't have to be strictly horror, but yeah. a lot of them are heightened, you know, if they have kind of a real element to it. And a lot of times things that happen in films are horrific, you know, yeah. whether or not it's presented in the way of uh, a traditional slasher film. You know, it's all about tone, really, too. Yeah. Yeah, so it's exciting to me to see what's going to happen with horror in the near future, because uh, like all these streaming services that are looking for content, the hopes that gives me hope that they continue to you know reach out for new and diverse opinions, and they find our opinions and possibly <laughs> diverse enough. I don't know, but yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Um, Trying to think any other brief and, and two, it's going to matter. The going to matter what executives and producers are involved because you know if they take you know if if their hearts isn't aren't into it. Um, and it's not something they generally like, and they're only making it because of the financial success. You know, that's not going to probably bode too well. It's just them if they if they can like give some control and some money over to people who really are passionate about it. Just like yeah. anything, not just horror, but in, in any aspect of any sort of art or anything like that, you got to have people that are passionate about it that are going to do it right well, and know how to handle it. Well, too, you, like you have the aspects too, like Sean S. Cunningham when he made Friday the Thirteenth, that was not for an artistic vision; it was to make money. But luckily he, you know, once he decided to do it, they got people involved who made something that, you know, lasted and was fun and Mm -hmm. set that franchise up. So hopefully even if there are people who are just opportunistically taking advantage of the popularity of horror, that spawns enough diverse material. Yeah, get the right people involved, yeah. And, um, yeah, so then there's a bunch, there'll be a bunch of new stuff on Netflix at least, um... Once again, we get no money from them or anything. We just, it's just, Netflix seems to be something that everybody has, so it's an easy place to point to show where their stuff at. Um, so they're going to have the hostile, like one and two, all the saw films, 
Cabin Fever. So some other, uh, you can see some Eli Roth films and Saw if you want. But um, we may go back and do his podcast on some of those at some point. Uh, we were going to do Saw at one point. We ended up not oh, doing yeah, it. Oh, yeah, we just watched. I thought we did the podcast on that. Yeah, we just yeah, watched we that. watched it because there's a new one coming out. So we may came back, come back yeah. and revisit that some here in the next month. But so you watch all those things. Um, and two, there's like other stuff we haven't really talked about. Like I mentioned before, like how we don't typically get too much into real world events. There's all the Harvey Weinstein stuff mm-hmm. where now this the floodgates are open and people are coming out with all these allegations. And you're just seeing like the casting couch stuff and all the scumbag behavior and sexual assault. Like it's always been going on. It's just people that are powerful enough to kind of keep a lid on it for a while. Yeah. And all it took was just a couple people coming forward and saying it today when people are more receptive to hearing that and taking it seriously. And then you have like Rose McGowan and others kind of just opening the floodgates. Yeah. Rose and is, then, man, she's like, she's going after them, which is yeah. great. And now Harvey Weinstein, it, you know, it wasn't just swept under the rug. Like he's yeah, out of his shined. company. His company may be folding. You know, he got kicked out of like all these different um, industry groups and things he was involved in. That so Amazon he's on exec too. Yeah. So wow. there was that show that he was involved with producing as we have Robert De Niro and um, I think Julianne Moore and it that got shut down. That oh, was yeah. A, that was, uh, uh, that was the um, dude that directed Silver Lining Playbook. Yeah. Um, I'm forgetting his name at the moment. But so the all American that, hustle also. Yes, yeah, so a lot of that stuff got exposed and the floodgates are continuing to open. And then you've seen some people like Woody Allen say, he's like, Well, I'm afraid this is gonna have a lot of people who are just crying wolf. It's like, mm, that sounds like somebody that- Yeah, I didn't read his thing yet, but I saw a headline like, Oh, it's it's sad for all parties involved. I was like <sighs> So the basic bottom line is in film there are a lot of scumbags and a lot of people who look to take advantage. And those claims should be taken seriously because hopefully like on everything that we've worked on, we've never, as far as I'm aware of, ever asked anybody to do anything they weren't comfortable with. Never, you know, casting stuff. Everybody had more clout than us. So we were just happy they're willing to work with us. But yeah, we, we I mean, there's not much for us to comment on Hollywood yeah. because we're not. Yeah, we're making independent <laughs> stuff on that. We're level. not roped into any of that. Yeah, so. on, the, on the level we're at, it's mostly just like you shoot my message on Facebook. That's like a friend of a friend's like, hey, you work on this? And they're like, oh, OK. Yeah. But yeah, like the but Hollywood there, side. Honestly, though, there's sleaze balls around here. We've heard stories of on the, yeah. the very low, but low to no budget level. Yeah, we like we know of certain people where it's like, hey, maybe avoid working with them like just with the actors well, that we worked with you know you hear stories going around like oh I, this person's a sleaze bag this yeah. person is yeah not naming any names yeah. or anything of that nature like i've been told stories about how people take advantage of the casting process even when they have little to no clout whatsoever uh because it is not that uncommon for somebody to be quote unquote casting for a movie and then not actually have any real movie they're actually making they're just trying to get women one-on-one in a room and to push the limits yeah. So that stuff happens at all levels of it, across all political spectrums, and should be called out immediately because I mean, we don't need any. I mean, in every industry, people like to dominate yes. power. You know what I mean? It's just while the working, film industry is a very weird thing that's you know different than your normal corporate world. Where, yeah, you know, kind of a, it's a blanket thing in that well, world. Like working in retail, I saw a bunch of scummy behavior yeah. too. So it, it's kind of pervasive across everything. It's just in Hollywood, it was more of a punchline and a joke for a long time. And I think now people have started to say, like, okay, this isn't regular or right, and we shouldn't let these people be in positions of power. So I think there's a lot of people right now who are probably pretty afraid that the shoe's about to drop on their stuff. So that's why some people, I think, have been a little bit tight-lipped uh, about all this. Yeah, yeah. Because, been- uh, like, somebody like Quentin Tarantino, who's very closely linked to Weinstein, I know. Uh, he, his commentary was, like, he was upset about it, and he needs some time to collect his thoughts. And was that official release? Because I saw Deadline. That was something that he was speaking to his friend, okay. uh, the actress Ann, Amber Tamblin, and she shared it via her Twitter account. Okay, yeah, because uh, I think Deadline picked up a tweet from the fake Tarantino account <laughs> and, and ran with that and published that as his thoughts. Yeah. And like we linked to it and everything. Yeah, because I think it was um he had had like lunch or okay. coffee or something with Amber Tamblin and like discussed how he's yeah. like upset about it and disheartened and he would need time to collect his thoughts since he had known this man for however many years. So there's like things like that where it's a lot of people might, you know, be more complicit in that type of behavior than you would think. But I think with Tarantino, it seems like he has pretty public fetishes that he's pretty clearly yeah. up, the, up front about. But... <laughs> Yeah, so basically across across <laughs> feet, any feet, yeah, feet. <laughs> uh, across any industry and across any line of work and or profession or vocation or anything you do, 
Like people should treat everyone with a basic level of uh, respect and common decency. Uh, I mean, it's, and, it's great that this stuff's coming out now, and, and that like hopefully people start being afraid, and it, and it deters future, uh, you know, future predators of yeah conducting that sort of uh, well, people, behavior. Like yeah, and, and two, whenever you hear people come for, I saw a lot of comments that would say like, oh, this actress made these accusations that you know, in her, in request for helping their career, he asked to do this and this. And then the first comment's like, well, did she do it? Did she take advantage of it too? It's like the thing is like, if you're talking about somebody who is a powerful adult yeah. who's in like their 30s or 40s, who has millions of dollars in clout, and they're taking advantage of somebody who's 18, 19, who's, you know... Starving artist. Starving probably. artist or, you know, man easily manipulated or things like that. Because when I was in college and I was 18, like, I mean, I probably made dumb decisions mm -hmm. or did stuff that I could have been more easily persuaded to do something than I would be now. So it's just, you know, there's a lot of victim blaming going on by some segments, but it's just like all this stuff should be taken very seriously and hopefully that stuff can be taken. And the horror world is pretty bad or, you know, at least it was pretty prevalent that you're like, oh, we just want nudity. Uh, we want everybody naked and all this stuff. So I'm sure there's a bunch of a bunch of stuff that went on over the years that hopefully occurs less and less. Mm -hmm. And everything yeah. is like nobody's pressured into nudity. It's more of just like somebody's paid and they want to do it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean... Like I said, we have no real experience with anything like that because we never worked on anything beyond like short films or like Volumes of Blood, where it was a pretty you know collaborative environment where it was all above board. But, um, but you know, like it's just like anything. Like in the corporate world, you can have a boss you don't know is like a scumbag, and then you find out, and it's like, well, and like with all the sports stuff that's going on, you mm -hmm. find out a lot of people had a lot of you know in college sports. There's a lot of scumbags out there, and you know, talk through their you know teeth about how they're so uh, honorable, and they're really not. So uh, take people's allegations seriously and treat them with respect and hopefully that stuff can be weeded out and people will be afraid to try to, ex you know, exhibit that behavior going forward. Yeah, because even if it doesn't come out tomorrow, it may come out in like 10 or 15 years like Harvey, you know, like it's you, you even yeah. if, you, if you conduct that behavior, yeah. you know, you it, it may come out whether or not it's now or yeah. not. And basically, uh, don't build statues of people until they've been dead for 100 years and you can verify every fact about them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so there was that information. I think that's kind of all the, the news. Yeah. Um, getting into what we've been watching, I guess, too, we can briefly go through the things that we watched. and Because we also watched some of the show on Netflix, Mindhunter, which is the, mm -hmm. new, uh, the new series. So we'll kind of save that for last yeah. and talk about the other stuff. So I watched um, The Babysitter which is a new Netflix original film directed by Mick G, uh, which is... Which he did, Terminator Salvation. Um, what did he do before that? Um, uh, in he, 2000. He produced a lot of TV uh, series. Yeah. And um, yeah, because he did Terminator. He almost did this, uh, the Mick Spaced show, which was the <laughs> spaced uh, U.S. adaptation and without getting... You know, without at all, I think, reaching out to Edgar Wright or Simon Pegg or Jessica Hines on that too, which... I don't think that rubbed oh. in the right way at all. Charlie's Angels. He directed Charlie's yeah. Angels. Um, he directed Charlie's Angels Full Throttle. Um, Which I we like are Charlie's Angels. We are Marshall. He yeah, was cool. he directed an episode of the show Chuck. Terminator. He directed the movies Terminator Salvation, uh, the movie This Means War, uh, Three Days to Kill. Um, then some different TV series recently, the um, Lethal Weapon TV series, and the Babysitter. So the babysitter had um, Samara Weaving in it, who was in Ash vs. Evil Dead, and I finally re remembered who she was. Who was she in that? Um, she was the blonde that showed up out of the group to the cabin at the end of the first season. Okay. And then also, too, what's his name? King Bach or something? Like social <laughs> media? Uh, he's like a social media star, I guess. Oh, I didn't really pay attention yeah, to I who I think I that. follow him on social media. I don't know his real name. Scroll through there. It's He's the black guy. Uh, right, let's go back. Oh. Right there. Andrew Bachelor. Yeah. Anyway, that's his like handle on Instagram or whatever. Oh, he yeah, does like King little Bach. short, short like videos. I mean, he's pretty funny. Like I saw him in the trailer and thought, oh yeah, like I enjoy him. I know that's a trend now to put yeah, social YouTube media stars in there. How, before you get into this, how was he in it? Did he translate well adapting to the big screen or was he just... So so it kind of plays into some of the things of this movie in general. Like he wasn't any worse than anyone else. Okay. Um, it was just to me. So the movie currently is sitting at a 6.6 .6 out of 10 on IMDb 
And I think it's gotten like, you know, decent reviews. I've seen some people talk about how they really enjoyed it. But to me, it came across as very generic because the basic plot without really spoiling it is there's a young boy who's 12. There's a prepubescent white male protagonist who had expected. And he, you know, has a babysitter who's a little bit older. And one of his friends convinces him to try to stay up one night to see what they're doing when he goes to bed. Because they're, you know, saying like, oh, well, she probably has a guy over or something like that. And then he sees more than he bargained for, and people are, you know, coming after him through the remainder of the movie. It's kind of one of those movies that's set primarily in one location. And to me, just the the tone was off. Um, it would have different parts where, like, titles popped up on screen, like, hell yeah, and, like, big, bold font. Mm, yeah. And it was... One, you know, there's the the music in it was kind of, you know, loud and booming at different times. And it had like more of a, to me, with like a generic TV show soundtrack for a show that's trying to be cool. Mm-hmm. And the, I mean, the performances weren't bad. I mean, it had a, then also had a, a Bella Thorne in it who was in that upcoming um, Amityville movie that I think you can watch on uh, Google Play for free now hmm. or before it hits theaters at least some period of time the movie's gotten delayed like five times um, she was also in the um, the first episode of MTV Scream um, but then you know it just has stereotypical stuff and it. it has like you know a girl on girl makeout scene it has stereotypical like over the top gore and a lot of attempts at humor that to me just all kind of fell flat and it, you know, set things up, you know, you very mentioned before the podcast that it felt like uh, a Tucker and Dale attempt almost. It felt like a, an attempt to do like a horror comedy, like a Tucker and Dale or something like that, but without really the heart in it mm-hmm. or um, the, I mean, the, and the, the performances and this tone and the music and all of it to me didn't mesh together to form like a coherent tone that got me into it. it does this feel like maybe he didn't really he doesn't really have his finger on the pulse of horror because I mean, he really hasn't done any horror before working in the industry this long. You would think if it was really something he was passionate about, he may like dip his toe in it, you know? Yeah. Is this a situation of like, we were talking like, Oh, horror is popular. Did he like, did Netflix say, well, if you do something horror based, we can give you some money for that. You know, like, um, to me, it just felt like it felt kind of like one of those like fright night or those, you know, kind of eighties movies like that, where it's more of like a young guy has to overcome some type of obstacle that has to do with like, the you gate. know, a killer or supernatural, the yeah. gate, there's kind of stuff like that. And those all had a very, those, those movies had a tone, you know, the fright night had some comedy in it and things mm-hmm. like that. But most of those movies, they were kind of playing it straight for the most part. As opposed to this one was kind of like winking and nodding a lot at like, look at how cool this is. Here's some text. Yeah. And there's just a lot of stereotypical stuff and it didn't really break any new ground. And none of the performances to me were funny. I know humor and all that stuff is very, you know, subjective. subjective yeah. So it, it's, I've seen, like I said, I've seen, I've seen people talk about enjoying it. But to me, it's just like the entire thing kind of fell flat. Uh, didn't really get into any of it or didn't find any of it funny. Didn't really laugh. It just to me felt like a very surface level movie that, you know, there was there was nothing subversive to it. There was nothing underneath. It was just more of kind of a modern day take on one of those, you know, like kid finds out things they have to stop in a single night stories. And do, do you think maybe younger people may enjoy this more like teenagers, you know, yeah. especially if they're using some social media stars and stuff like that? Like, like maybe that maybe just, the audience for it. Yeah, I'm thinking it's not really aimed at like the hardcore horror audience mm-hmm. or um cuz even something like Stranger Things or, you know, Tucker and Dale teaches with a res- it, it it handles it with respect, I think. They have a little bit of like reverence. Funny. Yeah. Yeah, it's like they really seem to like love and appreciate well, and, the and genre. two, I'm not somebody that like whenever a movie names a character after a horror icon, I'm like, "Oh my god, that's so much better." I mean, yeah. usually me that stuff can actually take me out of it. It just felt like Maybe it is aimed at teens who are like, you know, 15 to 17 who, you know, it's aimed at that audience. People that have babysitters. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe it was just like a huge, to me it was a big disconnect. I didn't really enjoy it. I mean, it's out there on Netflix and it's not, it's under an hour and a half long. So you can watch it, and not waste too much time. But to me it was just kind of forgettable. And one of those movies where like it set stuff up in the very beginning. It's like, oh, I know that's come back into play. And then, yeah. nope, nope, there it is. It's in play now. Yeah. And, you know, it just has some character actions that are kind of goofy. 
and you know it veers close at points to almost like um things like scary movie would have but without actually being played fully for laughs mm-hmm. so i didn't enjoy it i mean if i had to give it a score out of 10 it's probably like a five like technically it was well enough done the performances weren't terrible but nothing about it would really make me recommend it to anyone and i would say there's probably more original things you can find out there with your time uh than that but i did not really enjoy that um then mostly just watched Mind Hunter. I watched a number of episodes of that. So I'm trying to think. I don't think I watched anything else this week. Um, so did you watch anything so, aside from Mind Hunter? Yeah. Um, you know, not horror related, but he's dabbled in horror for sure. Uh, I think after the podcast Sunday, I watched that Spielberg doc. Yeah. It's like two and a half hours long on HBO. And I'd heard people complain, have complaints about it. Like, oh, well, it doesn't dive into this. And it, you know, and, and it's not, Maybe it's not illuminating on some sort of like deep psychological level on Spielberg or anything like that. Yeah. But it it at least like gives a good, well-rounded, I think, perspective on at least his life. Like I learned stuff about his own personal history that I didn't know before. Yeah. And then they touch on a lot of the films and kind of, yeah, they don't dive deeply into them, but it is already two and a half hours long. Yeah. And he's made Uh, a lot of movies. Yeah. I mean, it's not, again, it's not like the greatest doc ever made either, but, uh, but it's Spielberg. So yeah. like I had planned on watching it. Like I just turned it on and I knew like, oh, we may get busy. I can only watch like 45 minutes of it. I'll finish it later. Yeah. But really I ended up being able to sit there and I watched the entire thing at once and it was never boring at all. Um, there was only a couple parts where I kind of tuned out because it was for films I hadn't seen of his. Some of his like, you know, like stuff from like 2000 on yeah. that I hadn't seen. And I was like, ah, I haven't, War Her- War Horse? Yeah, I haven't seen War Horse. <laughs> I haven't seen Lincoln. War Horse. Uh, or um, oh, what was the spy film he did? Not spy. But uh, Bridge of Spies. Bridge of, yeah. Bridge of Spies. I haven't seen that. And I've been meaning to because I really like Spielberg. But uh, but yeah, it kind of also delves into some of the stuff that De Palma documentary does when, you know, he talks about how during the era of their younger days, like it was like him, uh, Martin Scorsese, yeah. De Palma, George Lucas. Um, I'm trying to think. I feel like there was somebody else too. It is basically that whole pack of people. They all went around and they were kind of helping each other out and competitive. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's just fun. You know, it's just like Hollywood stories about these like legends. And there will never be like a pack like that again, I don't think, because they were so disruptive to Hollywood, yeah. you know, with Jaws and Star Wars, uh, Martin Scorsese, the stuff he did with Taxi Driver. And uh, so um, that, that, that element was all very exciting. Um, I definitely recommend watching the HBO. Like, yeah, if you like Spielberg, if you like movies, you know, yeah. um, check that out. Um, then I watched uh, on. I was looking on Turner Classic Movies for. I was looking around to see if anybody had like the original Dracula yeah. or Frankenstein or just something. Um, I did get in like Evan Costello Meet Frankenstein. I yeah. <laughs> I bought that, which I love that as a kid, and going to watch that soon. But uh, I ended up watching Cat People. I think it's from like 1941. I'd never yeah. seen it. I heard a lot about it. Um, it's from a, p- a producer called Val Luton. Um, and uh, Martin Scorsese did did a documentary or he like narrates or hosts one too on him because he was like, I guess, this kind of somewhat famous um, producer, horror producer of that era. Um, and this was like the first film he did. And I think essentially... They gave him a name, like make a movie and the title is Cat People. Yeah. And that's all they gave him. And $150,000. Um, and uh, the film was like a huge success. I can't remember how much it made, but it was... it was Financially it, successful. Yeah, it was very funny. It was in, apparently it was in theaters so long that critics that watched it the first time, they gave it negative reviews. <laughs> they ended up going back to seeing it because it wasn't out so long and yeah. then like readjust their reviews on it. Um, and then also... Oddly enough, it is a little bit like Spielberg had to do with Jaws, is that he had such a limited budget, like there's a panther in the film. Yeah. And uh, they don't show it a lot. You know, they show kind of shadows and stuff like that because of the budgetary reasons. And the uh, apparently the studio wanted him to kind of make more of a monster, like the Universal stuff. That yeah. was their goal. But he didn't have much money either. And he thought, okay, no, maybe it's a little bit more suspenseful if we hide it in the shadows and don't really show it as much, which, you know, again, is what Spielberg did. Um, it's not like, you know, obviously it's not terrifying. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, you, you don't hear this in the circles of like one of the scariest films ever made or anything like that. But it is good. Like it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, grounded in a real story of relationships and people, but it also has to do with kind of the, the, I guess almost gimmick about it, um, which is a, a woman is from this a village and I can't remember the country anyway, 
she uh, she's in America. Uh, she meets a architect, and she tells him about like the story of uh, these people in her village that I think ended up like worshiping the devil and all this other stuff. They got ran into the mountains, and um, the legend had it that whenever they get super angry or jealous or anything like that, they will uh, turn into basically cats, big cats, and kill people. Cat so there's people. so there's there's this whole like uh, back and forth because you know like okay. She's falling for him, so if she kisses him, the whole thing is she's supposed to turn into this and rip him to shreds, or, or if there's jealousy. And then he has, like, a co-worker he works with who they kind of have a close relationship, you know? So there's, like, it's 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 centered around relationships, and it's not just, like, a gimmicky film, you yeah. know? Um, they did try to build a story around it. Um, I liked it quite a bit. I wouldn't put it up there as, like, my one of my favorite horror films of all time. I'm not going to say everybody has to run out and watch this film. Um, uh, but, uh, but it, it, what, it is fun going back some time and watching horror films like pre, you know, 1960s and 1950s, yeah. just cause they're a totally different feel really. Yeah. Um, I did enjoy it and I do want to dive into more films of that era just because I'm kind of, I don't know, a lot of the kitschy or, you know, um, slasher films from the eighties and stuff. I'm kind of tired of we need burning to- through a bunch of those. So I'm kind of like going back now like we, we need to do uh todd browning's freaks at some point and yes, it's relatively yeah. hard to get like a nice pristine copy yeah. like the fully uncut thing but that'd be something to do at and some uh point. uh doctor um oh, what is it i can't think of the full title now i don't know why i can't think of it the island of dr moreau no not that the island of dr moreau <laughs> the um, one no would you do the marlon brando val kilmer one <laughs> that's on somewhere as well too um but yeah cabinet of dr uh Calig- Caligari? Caligari. Caligari, yeah. We need to do that as well. That's also on there. Uh, and I was going to watch that, or somewhere. I was going to watch that as well. Um, but yeah, then I also watched Motel Hell. That was on that, I think it's called Mubi app or Tubi yeah. TV. Um, they have a bunch of free horror films on that. A little bit like Crackle, but not as many ads. And the quality is very good. Yeah. Um, I had never watched Motel Hell. You've seen that, right? I thought uh, you had. Yeah, but it's been a long time. Um, it's It was made in 1980s. But it's a little bit like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You know, here's some spoilers for it because it's not really... You can kind of guess where it's going. Well, and you've probably seen a lot of those elements from it and other yes, things. Yeah, the poster and everything. Um, you know, Texas Chainsaw 2 came out in 86, but there's a, there's a chainsaw battle in it. Um, there's essentially like a grandpa. Um, there's an older guy who makes sausage. And spoiler... <laughs> There's people in it. There's people yeah. sausage? Uh, a Cliff Clavin is in the film from Cheers, oh. <laughs> which is at least the second horror film I know because he was in House 2 yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it was fine, but at the same time, it's when that film got interesting again is when it kind of took a, takes a turn. Um, when at first you're like, okay, they, they make people into sausage. beef jerky <laughs> and sausage and all this stuff. I've seen this before. Like... Um, they do a couple more interesting creative things, but then honestly, there's almost like a relationship point of the film where it's as weird. We're almost like one of the survivors. Um, he, he essentially takes somebody to, you know, harvests them for meat. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll leave out the details of, of what that entails, which is really neat. But, um, and he takes, I guess the guy's girlfriend and then it's like, Oh yeah, you know, your boyfriend or whatever died. Um, and then for some reason she like just lives with them because yeah. she doesn't know what to do. I mean, it's like, you know, 1980, she's like, yeah. do I go back home? Uh, and yeah. then so she stays with them for a while. So then they become like close essentially, but really they're harvesting like her boyfriend. And then there's like almost like a relationship type thing, which yeah. is like an interesting thought. It's like, okay, there's some sort of human story there. Yeah. And again, like cat people, that's what was good about that. I mean, that's what, mis- that's what's missing out of a lot of like horror films for them to actually be good is to have some sort of element of. I don't know, human, like human experiences in there. Yeah, you know, not just it's not be, just a series uh, of kills. Yeah, somebody just kind of thrust into a tension filled yeah. situation. And again, Motel is not great. It's not like a super realistic or fascinating relationship, but at least it has that fold that makes it feel worth watching on some level. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I think aside from Mindhunter, yeah, that's all, that's all I watched. Yeah. So, and Dracula. So Mindhunter is a new series that David Fincher directed some episodes for, and he's one of the producers of it, and it's on Netflix. I know we've been referencing Netflix a lot, Um, and I watched the first seven episodes. I watched the first three because I just started today. Um, Yeah, so it's, you know, 
David Fincher is a director he on it. He directed four episodes. Again, that's why I was quick to, to watch it also because yeah. he directed the first two episodes and the last two, um, which House of Cards, he was like less... What, how many did he do of that one? Did you just do the pilot? I don't remember. Like House of Cards is a show that fluctuated me. Like the first two seasons I was really in. The mm-hmm. third season I don't really care for. The fourth season I was kind of and I haven't watched the new one. Yeah. Um, but Mindhunter essentially is a period piece that follows the FBI uh, or a couple of FBI agents when they start a, a unit to investigate serial killers and actually try to dive into the um, psyches and the, and the mental aspects of that. And trying to, you know, develop a lot of what is, you know, current day um, research and different like categorizations they use when it's, you know, trying to categorize serial killers. Because there was a point in time when serial killer wasn't a term that existed. Um, So this is, you know, about the early days of the FBI when they're trying to get that type of um, investigation, get that type of stuff put together. Because back in the day, it was mostly just like, oh, uh, somebody killed this woman because it was a guy who was married and she cheated on him, so he killed her. Or, you know, it was a drug user that kills when they came across them to find, you know, money to pay for drugs. Yeah, they, they I mean, they, they dive into that. Basically, originally it was all motive based. And then this turn, this change happened in society where suddenly there was a lot of murders happening that were that seemingly had no like well, traditional motive. There was like the Manson murders and things like that. So this was them trying to talk to serial killers that had been caught and then get into their psyche and to the mental side of it and try to develop, you know, trends or things they could look for based on conversations with these actual killers to help identify and figure out killers in the future or be able to catch people. So it's really interesting. And it's, you know, it's a period uh, piece. It's set in the past. So there's a lot of seventies. There's a lot of cool cars and stuff in it where, you know, like it's, and and it kind of has that milieu where it feels like, that era yeah and my favorite thing about the way fincher handles that i was talking to my wife about it because she was like oh that that you know her outfit's cute or whatever and i was like if the fincher films like sometimes when you're really trying to do something seriously anything goofy will often pull you out of it you know yeah. what i mean as far as clothing design set design it's things that are just stereotypical even if they are true if they've been used so many times they have a different context now yeah you know like if there was people you know girls rolling around on roller skates the whole time. You know what I mean? Like late seventies or, or, you know, like the neon color clothing. Yeah. Like that, that stuff. Well, you know, his films may be period appropriate, but it's almost like he kind of, uh, mutes it a little bit or, or even updates it slightly just so it's not, it doesn't stand out too much where it's distracting. Yeah. You know, like it, it keeps it, it makes it feel real and like you're in a real place and not just some sort of parody alternate reality that, you know, like, in your mind, like, oh, what should this it, look it like? It doesn't look like Austin Powers. Yeah, it's not a cartoon interpretation of the yeah. 70s. And even if it is maybe updated a little bit, like, I think that's in service of the show because it doesn't pull you out of it. You're not, like, pointing out everybody's hair. How, like, oh, look how big her hair is or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like, look at the beehive. Yes, and- yeah. Like, I, I really like that he... It's a very smart approach, I think, to handling yeah. this. When it is very serious stories, you know, like uh, the Zodiac and uh and and mine hunter yeah because like to me like this feels like you could watch zodiac and then watch this and it'd be a pretty good like uh uh double bill double kinda. bill or just you know getting in the right mood mm-hmm. so the the show looks great the performances are good um and then it dives into you know examination of actual serial killers that did exist so it's one of those shows where it's based on real events, but I'm not going to read up on all the real events until after I've finished watching the show because I don't want to kind of spoil things for myself, even though it's based on real life um, and the stuff has already and, happened. And but. like not just and too, like some people are way into serial killers and they're going to like eat the show up, get, get off on that on some level. But yeah. like the thing I really love about it too is, yeah, they do dive into like, why are these happening now? And you know, they, it, it's almost like they, they examine it from a society point of view. And there's even a, a dialogue exchange that between um, the main character and a girl, I think probably in the first episode, like, you know, the debate of uh, does crime exist when society is flawed? And his perspective is like, well, maybe society's flawed because crime exists. Yeah. You know, like there's that dialogue exchange yeah. in there is, I think, so phenomenal and good. Like some of the dialogue sometimes sounds like Sorkin. Yeah. from uh, the social network like it's so tight and and great and it's it's quippy 
but not annoyingly or, yeah. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel super unrealistic. It doesn't um, like, so like I mentioned the babysitter, it felt like there's a lot of like, look at me moments. Yeah. And to me, nothing in this, like it felt like normal conversations that there's like clever elements or things that make you think, but none of it like calls attention to itself. Yes. That makes you stop and think like, wait a minute. Yeah. I mean, I think that dialogue exchange kind of, there's like a bar <laughs> and something after that. And I think that there's a scene there that I think is like, probably one of my favorite scenes from, you know, dialogue scenes from a TV show. Yeah. Almost like ever. Like, you know what I mean? Like that feels like the opening scene of the social network. Yeah. Um, just when, because it's setting up so much about each of these characters. And I think that's a scene you can probably break down and do an analysis of it and talk about like, you know, what, it, what, what, it, what they're actually accomplishing. You're getting so much character information, world building information, kind of setting up maybe some of the themes of the show, like how, yeah. how things are looked at and immediately too, like, you know, I was thinking about, you know, the Las Vegas shooting that unfortunately happened yeah. because the thing about that now is everybody's like, well, why did it happen? He's not the normal person. And it's odd that this show like tackles that exact same problem. Yeah. You know, they're like, and it's, you know, multiple years apart. Yes. Yeah. And, and they're like, we don't, you know, we don't know why these people are doing these things that we're doing. And that's the whole thing. They're trying to figure out like, what's the shift in society? I think they bring up like TV's the change since, yeah. <laughs> you know, the FBI was originally chasing Dillinger and uh, people in the mob. They're like, yeah. now we're chasing these guys that are killing people for no apparent reason at all. Yeah. And, and where did that break happen? Like, that's what's been so fascinating for me. I've only watched three episodes, but yeah. the fact that it's not just some sort of procedural or just, you know, uh, fetishizing serial killers or just a kill of the week type thing. Like yeah. it really is almost examining American society too yeah. on, on some larger level well, as well. And, and too, like not to spoil anything because I've watched more episodes, but like when you have the interaction with these serial killers, sometimes they're almost a little bit charismatic or interesting, but then like one of the characters will remind them, it's like, oh, well they did cut off somebody's head and do yeah. this. So even though these serial killers sometimes can be like interesting, you, you kind of have to remember at the end of the day, this isn't Hannibal Lecter in a fictional series. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, a fictionalized the, account of a real person that did these real things. Again, I've only watched the third episode, but it seems like the fictional part is they're kind of coming along some murders in certain cities that they're that they're in at times that yeah. are fictionalized. But then they have interactions, at least from where I'm at, one serial killer. Um, who is a real serial killer and they yeah. bring up Charles Manson. So yeah. it seems like they have some real elements there. They're maybe dissecting where the turn was and where yeah. the turns are for these characters and, and kind of, I mean, really like diving into the whys yeah. and, and of a lot of this. Which well, is, and, and too, just some of it, you know, at the end of the day, without even knowing what happens, there's some people just do stuff for reasons you nobody can really mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. And, you just kind of kind of go with it but yeah I mean, so far like the fact that i watched seven episodes over the course of two days when you know i stayed in on friday night didn't do anything and watch that like it was to me pretty you know uh caught my attention made me see, you know watch it and and want to watch the next episode and you know there's good interactions between the characters in it um and you do kind of like the different things and there's, and there's you know, good interactions that have a, you know, ring of truth to them. Mm -hmm. And there was conversations I heard. Very funny there was, interactions. Like there was conversations between some of the characters that, you know, have to do with things that are in the cases they're dealing with, but then also in their personal life. Mm -hmm. And then it's also conversations that I have either had or overheard or, you know, so aware of that general type of conversation occurring. So very good show. The, something I'm the, really the interested older in. The FBI agent that, um, that's part of the show. He was in, I looked him up. He was in Fight Club as the mechanic. He's yeah. In Alien 3 and maybe one other Fincher. Uh, Holt. Yeah. One, maybe one other Fincher project. I'm not for sure. He was in Fight Club, Alien 3. Uh, he was also in Sully and Gangster Squad. Yeah, he's very good in it as well. Um, um, Jack Reacher. So he has that look of like a, of a cop or a agent or something yeah. very much. So, or of like an organized crime member. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I'm really interested in the show so far. Uh, I think the user scores on it and the reviews are pretty positive. So I'm definitely interested in finishing that out and seeing more of that. Um, so I, I was kind of more excited for this than stranger things just because it's Fincher. I mean, yeah. just cause it's one of the greatest working directors today you know, handling a, a few episodes of his yeah. show and his producing his new thing. Like, um, I was very excited for this and I'm very happy to see it. The, out. Um, I'm not surprised that it turned out this good. So it's something I think is of a lot of interest to horror fans, but in and of the show itself, there's not really horror elements as much. Like it doesn't show you the kills happen for the most part, unless it does in later episodes, but it's got a lot of interest there for, you know, just, just a good show. 
that can be easily watched by like you know somebody like my mom will probably love this show mm-hmm. um so it, you know it's a broad interest range people are just human interested in psychology which is yeah. interesting to anybody that is a human <laughs> that can so, process what's happening in this TV so it's show. not like a genre show it's more of uh, just an overall, you know, interesting show. So something I definitely re- recommend checking out. Kind of hold on, hold off on any actual scores or anything or defend reviews till I've finished it because yeah. it's still in progress. I'll, but so far, I'm really hooked. I'll finish it by next week and maybe Derek yeah. probably won't. Maybe yeah, we'll see. Derek was wanting to do some uh, podcast on some films or some stuff based on real life killers or, you know, or yeah. some some films that are retellings. Um, so this seems like right up his alley. Yeah. He's wanting to do some of that soon. We're like, sure, yeah. go ahead. Let us know which one's the cover. Yeah. But uh, this seems like right up his alley if he yeah. gets around to it. Yeah. So it's so like I said, no definitive review because it's not we have neither of us have finished watching it, but definitely a huge recommend if you're a fan of venture or just, you know, um crime stuff or psychology, things like that. I mean, and like I said, with the current events going on today, you know, it's even more prevalent yeah. or, you know, more relevant that there's you know, the, the criminal psychology is still not fully understood. So that show is just an interesting look at a time when things weren't seen the same way they are today. Cause a lot of people like them were black or white. It's like you're a, you're a civilian or you're a criminal mm-hmm. and it's not always that easy to understand how people go from one to the other, from a civilian to a criminal. Yeah. Or the want to understand perspectives on that, you know, to kind of get a better understanding of how to solve these in the future or maybe prevent them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So definitely recommend good. it. Um, so I guess now I can move into our review of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And this was the 1992 film directed by Francis Ford Coppola, starring Gary Oldman, Winona Ryder, Anthony Hopkins, Keanu Reeves. And then it had some other faces in it you may recognize, like Carrie Ells or Elway, however you pronounce his name. Uh, Billy Campbell, who is the Rocketeer, was in it. <laughs> um, so there's some familiar faces. Monica Bellucci. A Monica Bellucci dream, Cooper. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know why I didn't recognize her. <laughs> she was one of uh, the brides of Dracula. Oh, okay. So I guess That's we'll kind of do full spoilers throughout because this is a movie yeah. that you just, if you want, if you're interested in watching it, you can go ahead and check it out because it's a very, it's a movie that has a very strong evoke, like it very strongly evokes certain feelings, I think, or a, a certain um, type of feeling when you watch it because it's very atmospheric and to me it's a it's a good movie to throw on at halloween because it's a take on you know the lore of dracula and that you know trying to take a more literary approach Mm -hmm. to it and it has you know more of a sensual romantic element to it um it has you know gary oldman as dracula giving an interesting performance um so a lot there to, to, to find interesting. And, you know, it's a Francis Ford Coppola movie, which is always, you know, he's made some classics. Worth so. checking out, yeah. So this is a movie, too, that was popular in the early 90s. It made a good deal of money for its budget, but you don't hear a lot about it in today's mm-hmm. in today's current world. Because there's, like, the the universal dark universe reboot of all those characters. And nobody really talks about, like, this version of Dracula is, like, one of the, you know, inspirations for it. or You know, I mean... He, yeah, he goes heavy on the gothic horror, which is maybe not always, doesn't always have a broad audience. It seemed to have one here, but, you know, the thing I thought about was if uh, Guillermo del Toro was to kind of do his version of Dracula, yeah. how insanely well done that would probably be. Yeah. Granted, I really like when he tackles original properties and he does things. Well, like The Shape of Water is essentially where he couldn't get the rights this is all just conjecture, but like he could, it seems like he couldn't get the rights to the creature from the Black Lagoon, so did his own take on that type of character. Mm-hmm. And to me, this version why not give him the rights? You know, like why not? Well, but I think because a lot of those they want to have it tied up into nice, yeah. neat, tiny franchise films that can then flow into each other, yeah, I mean, as opposed to he would probably be more interested I mean, in making a take I know. on that. It's because they're getting so much use out of that character, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's 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 something. It's kind of a shame that character's been used more, but like Dracula. So this, uh, you know, Bram uh, Stroker's Dracula. It is. It's an interesting movie because, like I said, like um, it's a Cor- Francis Ford Coppola film, and he wanted to do it with as much like in camera effects and not using any CG of the era, and using you know miniatures or just using effects they could capture on camera on location. It's mostly shot in sound stages and studios, which you can kind of tell a little bit. It, yeah, it's a weird divide because it's better than bad CGI from that era, absolutely, but also to it almost. It feels like it's on a soundstage, but, you know, it almost gives it that feel of an also an old Universal film. You well, know, like it's it almost kind of evokes that feeling almost to a positive degree. 
even and, though it doesn't feel super realistic all the time. Yeah, well, it's because I think, too, like, with the, some of the other stuff that Coppola had worked on, he wanted that movie to come in on time and on budget, so uh-huh. they shot on sound stages to make that more achievable. Instead of, like, Apocalypse Now, right? Yeah, and st- <laughs> or, you know, doing, like, location shooting and jumping around. Yeah. So, and, and two, like, the, like I said, the movies, the visuals in it, the effects and a lot of the creature work and stuff all still holds up. Most of that doesn't look all that dated. The stuff that mm. you can only really tell... You can tell that there's some miniature work mm-hmm. and you can tell that there's, you know, some, I think they did some like rear projection stuff. So they yes. didn't have green screen. The anymore. battlefield kind of. So there was some projection type stuff. So some of that, like you said, it's still massively preferable to any type of crude CGI that was available or even CGI from like the early, like Van Helsing, the Hugh yeah. Jackman film. That all sticks out like a sore thumb and looks terrible as opposed to this still is visually interesting and evokes a feeling. It doesn't have kind of goofy-ish, like, looking vampire bullshit. It evokes a feeling in, when you watch it. At least you feel like somebody made this with their hands and not it wasn't made poorly on a computer, you know? And, and you know, it being more of kind of like a literary type, uh, it, it had to feel more of like a literary ad- adaptation versus like a schlocky monster film. The, the atmosphere and then the sets and all that kind of go towards that. And... And two, watching this, so we, you know, we're in Louisville, Kentucky. They have the Actors Theater always does Dracula, so it makes me want to see that. Oh, uh, have you not seen that? Uh, no. I was talking about wanting to go back really bad. Yeah, because I think Julian and I are going to go see it at some point. Yeah, it's very good. Now, not to diss anybody, but I've heard that there's a good Dracula and a bad Dracula that does it. <laughs> so I don't know how you find that out, but I think the good one yeah is working maybe this year i may have that wrong but yeah, well, well but I, 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 we saw the good one yeah and honestly it was so good and i kind of like the approach to the story more in that than i did in this yeah um, you know just kind of the way everything was handled and the pacing and all that yeah. like it's yeah the local performance of dracula is very good yeah and then um you know, like other things to compare this to in the same general area you had uh dracula dead and loving it mm-hmm. with leslie nielsen and all that stuff so like a lot of that in my mind what about a, a, a vampire in brooklyn isn't that the same era as well yeah there's vampire yeah. In brooklyn uh so this was on vampires before twilight and blade and and underworld and these different kind of um franchises that made them more action films or romance films or kind of fetishized type um characters this was was still you know like you had the more literary dracula or you know vlad the impaler that became dracula because you know and then the costumes in the movie are very awesome too because when gary oldman when he is you know before he becomes you know count dracula or dracula when you know before he becomes a vampire his costume was kind of when i was a kid and saw parts of it and piece of it here and there his costume was kind of scary and mm-hmm. looked kind of like fleshy and yeah uh kind of like exposed muscle his kind of like red suits they they put a lot of focus on the movie on the costume design and then in the movie there's kind of like the wolf creature the wolf man version of dracula and there's kind of like the super huge tall half human half bat version of of dracula that was that was that's that's a really cool moment i think that's like one of my favorite yeah spectacle moments of this of the film so the movie has good effects and it looks good and it has a feeling that's vastly different than a lot of the other you know cinematic interpretations of dracula and then you have in the cast you have anthony hopkins as van helsing you have gary oldman as dracula you have winona Ryder in it uh but then you also have mm-hmm. keanu reeves and he's an actor that you know like in um, john wick john wick 2 loved him a lot of movies he's you know a good part of them the matrix i thought he was you know, at least in the first matrix he was like well cast mm-hmm. for that but i think this was just um it, he was kind of out of his depth yeah, at that point in time yeah compared to you know it was a huge juxtaposition between him and gary oldman and anthony hopkins you know yeah, you winona had, Ryder maybe was also a little you know she didn't stand out that much but she maybe also wasn't a perfect fit either but i feel like once you get in the film she kind of fills into her role and yeah. she feels a lot more she doesn't stand out like Keanu does in this. Yeah, so you, like, Keanu, and I don't want to bash on Keanu, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, he's not he's not great in it. It's not his. This isn't his role. Of course, he's doing kind of like this weird faux British accent. Yeah, but you can just feel like watching this any moment. He's like, dude, whoa, <laughs> Dracula. Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's like totally awesome. So it's like it felt like you could see him slipping into like his like surfer. Um, his surfer speak or whatever from like Bill and Ted and things like that. And, you know, like I said, it's not to take anything away from him because there's a lot of stuff he's been in that mm-hmm. I've enjoyed. I think he's just an actor that you kind of need to have the right material and the right direction and the right type of setup for to work. Yeah, you can't put, 
I'm not, I'm not trying to just uh, be comparable to their acting abilities or anything. And I also love him, but you can't put Spielberg in the middle of this film either with these two. You know what I mean? Yeah. With, he can't be Frankenstein's monster and yeah. start talking uh, as Schwarzenegger because it just it just pulls you out. Well, and, you know? I mean, and, and two, like a lot of these types of movies, like I think uh, Coppola had said that, you know, for that role, the role that Keanu Reeves was playing, the Jonathan role, that it wasn't a great role with a lot of depth to it. So they just wanted somebody who would kind of draw like attention to them or be kind of like a matinee idol. A market, marketable. A marketable star yeah. that women liked and that would, you know, at least give you some um, reason for Winona Ryder's character to have like interest in him versus Dracula and all this stuff. And then he saw Bill and Ted on VHS and was like, <laughs> mm, I found my man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, so like, like you know, the overall casting of it, I think, is pretty good. However, with um, with Keanu, I think it's just miscast, and you know, I think later in his career he would have been. But like I said, when you have Anthony Hopkins and Gary Oldman, yeah. anybody that's not really on their level is going to kind of stick out some, yeah. and so that that I think is one of the weaker elements of the film but since his character doesn't do a lot to begin with and isn't really at the forefront you don't have as much uh, it's not as big of a problem he's not in the way through most of he's not in the way through most of the film once he gets yeah. out of the way then you can kind of jump into the film yeah, and, you have, and get a little lost in it more than you were because when you have more going on with Dracula and Van Helsing and all that stuff like there's more going on so he's in there and is you know part of the focus of it from time to time but it's not. I'm trying to think of other examples of movies where somebody just so the um, the King Kong, the Peter Jackson King Kong, Jack Black, I think was miscast in that movie as well, and was used throughout a lot of it. And, you know, they had him delivering some of the movies like penultimate dialogue yeah. about like uh, "Twas Beauty That Killed the Bee." So yeah, that he didn't bother me too much in that film like he did some people. But yeah, that last line. Yeah. Did not set well. So with me, this, especially Keanu, being the last line of the film, Keanu Reeves is not given the same narrative heft in this film. Yeah. So even though he's a little bit miscast and a little bit out of his depth at times with the other leads, um, it's not anything that destroys the movie just because he's not the focus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Winona Ryder is pretty good in it, um, he said you just have, you know, Anthony Hopkins is is Van Helsing. And that was when, you know, the same general era of Silence of the Lambs, because that would have just came like a year before. So you kind of go from playing Hannibal Lecter to Van Helsing and he gives a good performance as Van Helsing is, you know, kind of unhinged a little bit at times mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, excited about everything that's going on. And a lot of the supporting cast, it is funny with Carrie Ells being in it because he was also in um, Robin Hood Men in Tights, the Mel Brooks film. And then the Mel Brooks version of Dracula Dead and Loving It, he could have fit just in just yeah, as well in that. Yeah. Um, I mean, Keanu Reeves even too probably could have done well in the comedic version, but it's funny to that that era. Um, you have those actors kind Crossover. of crossbreeding yeah. between those different types of films. Um, but for that type of for that film, he was fine. Um, and like I said, I think to me the biggest selling point for the movie is just the the feeling that's evoked with like the sets and the creature effects and and all that. But it's not it's not really. Um, like heavy on like actual scary horror elements. No, it, yeah, it's, it's almost just atmosphere. more of a kind of a Dracula, I don't know, romance story. You know, it's about kind of his love. Yeah, and there's some moments in there, but it's not about Dracula going through the city, killing people, and Van Helsing trying to track down. You know, trying yeah. to track him down uh, and stop the murders. Like it's not about him. It's just not wanting blood. Yeah. It's not the it's not the Hugh Jackman Van Helsing where he. <laughs> It's flipping around and, and, and shooting, you know, uh, bow and arrows with ropes on them to creatures and flying around. And there's a bunch of leather everywhere. You know, you, you have more of the, you know, you have the elements where it's supposed to be like on location, like out in like Eastern Europe. And then there's like the locations that are in England. And between the two of those, like the, they do feel a little bit different. Mm -hmm. and, and two, it's not as heavy on the Renfield stuff as um, some of the other versions of Dracula. You know, Renfield's more of like a, you know, secondary character that's kind of on the fringes of the story. Yeah. And, you know, there's other elements of it. Like, and then there's like Dracula's Brides when they have the weird kind of sexual stuff with Keanu Reeves character. So there's a lot of stuff in it that looks good and is like disturbing imagery to some extent. Um, like I said, I think that they made a wise choice doing all, all the things they could practically in camera. Yeah, absolutely. Because at the time, like Jurassic Park holds up, but not a lot else from those eras hold up when they throw in digital effects. 
because a lot of times it's very obvious and very clear what they're doing and it looks bad this you know even if some of it is is obviously fake it gives it a feeling and a tone and a mood and atmosphere it doesn't like distract from it make you think oh this is utterly fake yeah even though it feels like th- this stuff's sh- sh- shot on sound stages and everything yeah at least it feels like it's part of like one world and it's like okay yeah this is a, some fabricated world but it all feels cohesive when you throw in a cgi monster yeah it's like okay this is something else is clashing with this world i'm yeah. in right now you know at least it all feels like it's part of one reality yeah even if it's removed from being super realistic um you know almost again like crimson peak like it yeah. feels you know, romantic on that level. And, you know, uh, yeah, I, I would like to see more romantic Gothic films in this vein. Well, yeah. Cause like, vein, like you, you said, know? Crimson Peak, that's a good corollary. Like if you enjoyed, uh, Crimson Peak that you'd seen recently, the Guillermo del Toro film, and you haven't watched this version of Dracula, then I recommend checking it out because yeah. it's one of those movies that has, you know, kind of romance at the core and it has horror elements on the fringes. Well, not being a straight out and out horror experience. There's mm-hmm. horrific elements in it, and there is a lot of blood that happens from time to time. But in and of itself, there's nothing really scary. Yeah. Like when I was a kid, seeing the pinball machine made me more scared of the movie than it actually would have it. I watched it. Yeah. For some reason, when I was a kid too, like I remember seeing the box art, but it didn't. I think I probably saw the trailers on TV because it didn't seem like anything that was super appealing to me. And maybe they did kind of let you know it was kind of a gothic romance i don't remember the trailers exactly but at this time you know i rent it nightmare on elm street and friday yeah. the 13th and i may have felt like oh this doesn't seem like there's enough goofy kills in it yeah. you know and i'm it may have just not appealed to me at the time and yeah crimson peak probably doesn't appeal to 12 year olds now yeah you and, know? And, and, so it's probably the same sort of thing yeah because crimson peak i think something that went against it was a lot of times they marketed it as almost a haunted house film yeah and that really wasn't what it was. And this movie, I don't remember the advertising, but I do remember it being Francis Ford Coppola. So I think it was advertised a little bit more of like, oh, it's kind of like an Artur's take yeah. on this like classic legend. Because I do remember in comic books there being ads for it. Yep. And then I remember there being ads for the video game. Mm-hmm. Um, so I remember... Marketing el- was heavy on this, or so at least the, the things around it as well. So I remember the elements of things like that, and it's one of those stories, like, you know, there's a lot of stories that people get tired of and get burnt out on, but I think, like, Dracula and Frankenstein, a lot of those, you can always come back and do different takes on it, mm-hmm. uh, just because it's such a classic story that you can take different elements of it and focus on those, you know, in different eras. Like if you want to, cause I know there's been some other ones, like there was the Victor Frankenstein movie with, um, Daniel Radcliffe oh, yeah. and, uh, James McAvoy. That's somewhere to watch as well, but I did not watch that. And then there's been, there was that Dracula untold movie a year or two ago. So there's been a bunch of different versions of these universal, you know, well not the, cause Dracula goes back a long time ago, yeah. but you know, like the universal era of, you know, monster films. And, you know, you think of like the old Dracula and the Bela Lugosi and all that stuff. You think of those, and then you, this new movie doesn't really, or not the new movie, but the, the or Coppola one doesn't really feel like those in any way, shape, or form. It feels like it's its own disconnected item where that, you know, is what it is. And, like, the, the kind of backstory on how Dracula comes to be when, you know, he kind of renounces God and all that stuff in the church and then stabs that's the really cross. Cool. Yeah. That's all well done and creepy and, you know, is, to me that is better than kind of a kitschy vampire lore type thing. Yeah, it, made, it, it immediately makes him almost a sympathetic character, you yeah. know, immediately. So you start from a different place. Kind of going off on a tangent, did you watch the Castlevania series on Netflix? Uh, I watched part of it and didn't really get into yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, I liked kind of the stuff they did with Dracula there because that's also like, you know, essentially he's taking revenge on the church and the city yeah. because of, uh, you know, his love or whatever, which I also like that element of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I like it when, when the monsters are not just monsters, you know, which is a lot of, again, you know, Frankenstein's monsters that way, you know, Dracula, yeah. when they present Dracula in that way as yeah, well. Yeah. Cause he comes across as, you know, like this kind of tortured character and mm-hmm. within Winona Ryder's character sees like a reincarnation of his lost love. And, you know, so that does give a little bit more of an, an element to it than just kind of like a creepy, uh, pervert dracula that's just trying to kill yeah. and seduce women so it gives a little bit more twilight element. yeah <laughs> so it gives you it gives you more of like a little bit of narrative oomph to it uh and like i said i think that the the movie overall now it's it's like a little over two hours um 
And then the version that both of us watched was the one that was on Sci-Fi because you have Sci-Fi Network. It's on their video on demand. Which they blur out the boobies. They I blur think out the some nudity. of it down a little bit. So there's a little bit of stuff that's missed from that, but you can rent in all the rental services for like two or three dollars, I think. So it's not necessarily hard to find. Yeah. It's just one of those movies that you see on TV some because I remember that's, seeing it on yeah. TV, and but you don't hear a lot about it in popular culture. Like it was relatively it was successful when it came out, grossing over two hundred fifty million dollars worldwide. And then, of course, you had like home video and a lot of that when those markets actually made money for movies. But it, it, it just it probably just doesn't have a lot enough of those really iconic moments that horror fans like to latch on to. You know, like even yeah. if it's a bad slasher, if it has like a great ending or yeah. a couple great kills, people will latch on to it and they love it for that. This has some great moments, I think, for sure. Yeah. But if for some reason, it, it seems like it's uh, the... Some of the diehard horror fan base, it's just left of maybe what appeals to them on a on a big level. Almost. Yeah, I mean, I think like the just based on like yeah, what we hear about. It. Like, I did see an artist post about it today, yeah. which is weird because I'm like, I barely see people talk about this film. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's it's just it didn't quite hit the mark with that audience. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, because I think a lot of it is it has like the cool creature designs. Like we said, mm-hmm. some of those really stand out and look good today. It's just that it was a little bit too much to the literary side to really appeal to, at the time, the crowd that was probably into your Friday the 13th and Halloween mm-hmm. sequels. And not that there's anything wrong with different viewpoints. It's just what it was is something I think was more of a mainstream audience movie that may have been a little bit too grotesque for some of the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it still did well enough. It just, it just doesn't seem like it's, you know, the state at the forefront of anybody's minds in the years since then. And then the reason we did the movie, just trying to think of stuff for October that feels like Halloween. And and to me, that movie feels very 90s. Yes, just the yeah. overall feel of it reminds me, maybe it's just the connections I have of the, the pinball well, machine. Well, the actors, too, and the ages that they were. Yeah. Keanu. Yeah, like, Keanu, yeah. Winona Ryder, and they're both yeah. in their early stages of their careers. You know, you had Anthony Hopkins when he was still doing, you know, higher brow material before he got into being Transformers, King Arthur's oh, yeah. sword or whatever it's called. So you, you had a lot of these actors and Gary Oldman before he became known for, you know, his super over the top characters like Fifth Element or, you know, the bigger blockbusters like um, Dark Knight that he was in or the Batman series, the Christopher Nolan Commissioner series. Commissioner Gordon. Christopher and he was Gordon. in uh, the second Planet of the Apes and very good in that as well. Yeah, so he's an actor that's kind of a chameleon, you know, almost like Daniel Day Lewis, Daniel Day Lewis, <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis, <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis, <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis level of kind of, kind of gets into these roles yeah. and kind of disappears into them. So if you compare his Dracula from this film to say the Fifth Element, you know his character in that, or you know, uh, what's the movie he's in with Matthew McConaughey and Peter Dinklage and Kate Beckinsale, where he's supposed to be a um. I don't know the politically correct term, uh, but he's supposed to be a shorter person. And he oh, ha- I didn't know that. You don't remember? Th- you Is haven't heard of that? Um, no, that's not Peter Dinklage. Is no. Peter Dinklage? Uh, Peter Dinklage is in it in a small role, but it's supposed to be where Gary Oldman is a um, shorter person and Matthew McConaughey is his brother. And it's just this. Is it a we- twins remake? <laughs> <laughs> it's this weird but ass movie. One of my favorite Gary Oldman performances is uh, Leon the Professional. I absolutely love him in that. Um, I think he does like a killer job. It's just such like a big performance. Tip yeah, it's uh, Tiptoes. Oh, man. See, that's where he's supposed to be playing. That's interesting. Uh, so, yeah, that's... So he kind of disappears into these characters. And... This looks like a fake movie, William. It, it but it's like real. It's photoshopped It is cover. unfortunately real. He looks like somebody you went to high school with too. Uh, <laughs> so he really, he really falls into the characters yeah. in, the, in the Gary Oldman. So he really disappears into the characters and his Dracula, when he has kind of like the weird white skin and the big bulges in his head, like that's a look that even if you never saw the movie, you've probably seen that type of version of the character represented somewhere. Yeah. Um, Which kind of reminds me of um, Barbara Streisand from uh, Hocus Pocus. Yeah, so uh, that's, that is true. <laughs> so, like, you know, the movie has a very um, 90s feel to it. It has all these different stylistic elements. The performances, you know, they're all pretty good. Keanu's a little bit, out of, you know, miscast, I think. Um, but aside from that, like, none of it really sticks out as bad. Um, you know, like I said, it's over two hours, so it's, you know, it moves a little bit slowly at times. Yeah. Um, I, I Yeah, I, I'd only watched bits and, bits and pieces of it on TV, but, you know, I didn't really, like, walk away loving it. 
Um, but also, you know, I was a little distracted watching and stuff. Yeah. But I still like. For, I mean, you want to get into the scores, I guess. Now, at this yeah, point. I guess we can kind of give it our you know final I mean, thoughts and scores. For me, I definitely think this is a film that if I watch it again soon or even next year, I'll probably like it a lot more. Yeah. Because I'm like, okay, I know what to go. I, I know what I'm gonna get going into this. Yeah. And now I can. Maybe not focus on some of the surprises as much or some of the directions that the film takes and kind of just, yeah, enjoy the atmosphere and yeah. mood. So I can see me liking this more and more over time. And it is something I think if there's like a good HD version somewhere to watch, yeah. I won't probably dig into the sci fi version again. Yeah. Not that there was anything wrong with it. Just, just get the actual, like, I want to see the actual version. version, full uncut version. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I can't see myself putting this on again, like next year or something like that. And, you know, like I said, I, there's a lot I appreciate about it. I was a little bored at some points. Uh, I would probably give it uh, like a 6.5, maybe a 7, you know, probably yeah. a 7. Um, it's not stellar, but I appreciate it more than even some films I would give a 7. Some films I give a 7, I'm like, it's okay. I don't know. There's just something about this that I feel like there's more value to it that I, I would enjoy yeah. Uh, watching this again for sure. Well, see, there's a uh, Blu-ray two-pack that has Bram Stoker's Dracula, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein for seven eighty three on Amazon okay, Prime. Cool. So we should have just done that. I might get that at some yeah. point. But the um, yeah, so the movie it's one of those things where if you haven't seen it and you're interested in what we've described, more kind of like a you know literary kind of art house theatrical take on I think Dracula is a good a so good term for that this. kind of take to me makes it interesting and worth watching. So I think it's similar in line to you. I think it's like a seven because it's, you know, it's visually interesting. There are good performances in it, even Mm -hmm. though if some of them are a little bit weak and overall it's an appealing package, but it doesn't appeal to everyone. And it's one of those movies I could, this isn't a throw it on and show when you have a bunch of people over for a Halloween party because it moves a little bit slow for that. You got to be there for the performances and just kind of letting those characters get into the roles yeah, and, and just enjoy the costume designs and just, yeah, kind of the feel of it yeah. rather than turning your head for a second and seeing a couple exciting moments and then looking back, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a movie that I think is worth watching, but it's, it's definitely not for everybody. But if you, if you're interested in kind of a theatrical take on Dracula, that's not kitschy and hammer horror ass, not mm-hmm. that all those are kitschy, yeah. but they have, they evoke a certain feeling and this, this evokes a different feeling. Um, and the effects like reminds me of other stuff from that era, uh, even movies that aren't related to it whatsoever, you know, kind of the gothic stylings of it. You know, like you had the 1989 Tim Burton Batman mm-hmm. movie, so kind of the Tim Burton stuff. Yeah. So, but this to me has less noticeable effects than some of those. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at least from that aspect alone, it's definitely worth checking out. So I guess I'll wrap up our review of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And if you're listening to the podcast via iTunes, you can do us a huge favor and leave a review that helps other people find the podcast. You can find all the work we're doing at housebyvideostore.com. You can find links there to all of our social media we, accounts. We got a new little background on there, a site refresh that happened yeah. a couple weeks ago. And then um, we've got a nice big player in the middle of it. So any like featured content is going to be there. So if you go to the site, you know, our podcast is going to be there. Any articles, we don't do a lot of articles now, uh, but like that a big window there is you can go there and just play it so you don't have to yeah. dig around for it if you listen to this through like iTunes only yeah um, or even if you're on YouTube and you're listening to this later or our feature content has been buried in our playlist like you yeah. can go there and after the slasher is on there now which is the short way I'm just directed that's kind of hitting a couple places now yeah. a couple sites um, and maybe showing up um, yeah it's been um, we put it out there it got selected for the I think we discussed on the last one, the um, 15 second horror film fest each week they do something called Fright Days. They pick like a short film or a couple of short films and put them out through their page. So it got selected for that. So it's been shared through there, uh, maybe getting shared somewhere else. So once we have all the solid details on that, we'll release it. But you can watch it now if you just go to housebevyastore.com. It's a big player right in the middle of the page. You can watch it there or you can just watch it via our YouTube channel. And then we have another short pluck that'll be coming out soon. So you can watch out for that. Um, like I said, check out the site if you haven't in a while. It's been refreshed, so it's a little bit cleaner. Uh, it's not using the same template that iHorror uses, which our old one was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or I don't know who existed first, but they had um, the same basic WordPress template that we did. And they had theirs, I think, set up for like two columns of uh, content versus ours just being one. Did we ever take a screenshot of our old website? 
Uh, I don't think we, we did. We did, so we'll never remember what it looked like. Yeah, man. yeah. But, well, you can go yeah. look at yeah. iHorror, <laughs> and, and it's that similar. Not that anybody. It's just a WordPress yeah. template. We don't we do as using. many daily. Uh, we were doing like something every day. We were trying to <laughs> for that. Yeah, it made sense for that. We, yeah, like years ago though, we were doing something almost every single day. Yeah, and it made sense for that. And now our content is more trickle or bigger stuff in podcasts. Yeah. So we don't really need that list of blog post style yeah on our site something anymore. that's more focused on a few featured items at the top yeah. and then like a big video player because mm-hmm. we're trying to do more shorts and original content so yeah you can go there you can see um keep an eye out the short plug will be coming soon as well and then we may have some other stuff coming up before too long but uh, i think that'll wrap up all of this episode so if you can find us on social media make sure to follow our official instagram account at hbtvs underscore official and our twitter and facebook and youtube because that's where you can find most of our content you can find all of the links at housepipevideostore.com. Um, and I, I did recommend people to follow me on Twitter, but I don't really use it much anymore. So I'd say just follow our Instagram uh, account because I'll probably mo- post more stuff through there because I'm going to try to start getting into doing more of the stories mm-hmm. just, you know, for quick hit content and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, maybe we can start um, taking some screenshots of our news articles and posting on stories and having our little comments under it. Well, yeah, you know, that's a good way to do news without actually having to put a ton of work into it, you know, yeah. and, but, but have, have a little bit of commentary on it. Yeah. And we can start doing some of that, too, you know. Yeah, so make sure to follow us on Instagram because yeah. that'll be where you start posting more stuff. Yeah. But, uh, all right. Yep. Well, that'll bring this episode of the House by Viosaur podcast to a close. Thanks for listening. House by the